So the new Mac Mini just came out, and while everyone is talking about how great the value is on the base M4 chip, I was really curious about the M4 Pro variant. I've had this for about a week now, and have been using it for all the video production on this channel. And in this video, I wanna share my experience with you guys, and also talk about a few things which you should know before you make the purchase. Now, on the surface, it seems like the only difference between the M4 and M4 Pro chip is the amount of CPU and GPU cores, which is not true. There are two other key differences starting off with the storage. The SSDs on both the base variants aren't the same. If you got the M4 base variant with 256 gigabytes of storage and the M4 Pro base variant with 512 gigabytes of storage, your SSD speeds are vastly different. With the M4, you're getting anywhere from 2500 to 3000 megabytes per second read and write speeds. And with the M4 Pro, those speeds are almost doubled. 6,000 megabytes per second read and almost 5,500 megabytes per second write, which can significantly impact the performance of your computer. And it's very crucial for video editing. With the M4 Pro, you should be able to work with larger projects, handle you know, more data, and just import footage quickly. So if you care about disk speeds, the M4 Pro Mac Mini might be worth considering. The next difference is towards the back. Both the M4 and M4 Pro Mac Mini come with three Thunderbolt ports. With the M4, you get Thunderbolt 4, and the M4 Pro gets you Thunderbolt 5, which is a newer, faster generation. It is a faster interface. Now, the difference between the two isn't that huge, and if you're someone who doesn't use a Thunderbolt dock or a really fast storage, you shouldn't worry about it. But in the future, when accessories come out for Thunderbolt 5, like displays, docks, especially storage, you are gonna get better performance. Now, you shouldn't go ahead and spend the extra $800 just for the Thunderbolt 5, but it is something you should know about. So for my first test, I have a 4K 30fps clip, which I shot on my phone. I have Premiere Pro open as well as DaVinci Resolve with the same clip on the timeline. And we're gonna do a stabilization test to see how long it takes for both these softwares to complete the stabilization process. So for Premiere, I'm gonna be using WAP Stabilizer. Before I start the test, I'm gonna get the timer and boom. So we have started the WAP Stabilizer on the clip in Premiere. And I wanna give you guys a disclaimer. Premiere isn't the most optimized software for Mac, for Apple Silicon, and it even has issues on Windows x86 PCs these days. So if you're gonna be you know, buying a Mac for video editing, I'd say, use Final Cut Pro or switch to Resolve. It's free, more reliable, more performance. I personally have been using Premiere for eight years now, and it's already embarrassed me. It's taken way more than it should for stabilizing a smartphone clip, but that's the state of Adobe Premiere in 2024. So we are almost approaching 40 seconds and we are still analyzing the clip. So that's that. And we're done stabilizing at 42 seconds. Now, I'm gonna go into Resolve and run the same test. And I'm not even gonna use the timer for this. I'm gonna click Stabilize for this clip and that took like four seconds. That's the story of Premiere versus DaVinci Resolve in 2024. Now we're gonna move on to timeline performance and playback. So I have about 10 minutes of 4K video files from the Canon R6, shot in 4K, 60 FPS, 10 bit, 422. I have Drag them on the timeline. I'm gonna use my phone just to show you guys that we are on full playback quality and we're gonna try playing this back. So with no LUTs, no color grading, just the clip itself, it seems to be playing back pretty smooth, but there is a delay in me pressing the space bar and Premiere kind of reacting. It's like less than a second, but just wanted to you know let you guys know. Now, what we're gonna do is drag an adjustment layer. Before that, I'm just gonna try and scrub through this. We are still kind of dropping frames. This is quite high bitrate. Let's just drag a lot on top. So let's put the adjustment layer. I'm gonna go into a random lot. This is, of course, really hideous colors, but just to test the performance. We're still able to scrub through this in full quality, playing back the video now. Again, seems to be working quite smoothly, pretty smooth. 60 FPS playback, but I wanna make this a little more challenging for the Mac Mini. Of course, as I said, if you do these tests on uh, Adobe Premiere Pro, you're gonna have worse results, but if you do it on Resolve or you know something else, you're gonna have better results. So I have clips here from the Sony A7S III. We're gonna drag those onto the timeline and just 
try and spread apart the clips because that's how you would edit in a real life scenario. You know, think of this as, you know, separating A roll and B roll clips on top of each other. So again, with two layers of 4K, the Sony clips are also 4K, 30 FPS, 10 bit 422. So we're just scrubbing through pretty decent performance and we're still able to play back on full quality and get that smooth 60 FPS result. Let's make this a little more challenging. And now we're gonna go into the Sony ZV-E10, which is like a vlogging camera. I am gonna take a few clips. These are also shot in 4K, but not really that high bit rate, maybe 100 megabits per second. Drag them onto the timeline. And this is the last one. So let's just see how the playback is. Still very smooth. The Mac Mini is able to keep up with three layers of 4K video now. Pretty smooth. You can see the race car game is looking quite smooth in the background. So I'd say 4K video editing is a pass on Premiere Pro. Again, do it in Resolve or Final Cut and get better results. Now what we can do to make this more demanding is add a layer of motion graphics. So we're gonna take this title and drag it on top. So let's just drag this on top right here. It's gonna say we're missing fonts, but that's fine. We just wanna see how motion graphics plays back. So there is a little bit of lag, but again, motion graphics are quite heavy. So if you're gonna be working with multiple layers of 4K video, color grading, effects, transition, just go ahead and drop the playback quality. And we're gonna try and do that here to maybe a quarter and just see how our motion graphic plays back now. I'm gonna go into full screen. And you can see that this is quite a heavy motion graphic with some textured layers and stuff. Again, pretty smooth playback. I'm gonna render this clip and come back to you guys with the render times. But in Premiere Pro, at least, the 4K video editing experience is pretty decent. Now what we're gonna do is move on to DaVinci Resolve. Here, if I go into this tab, I have an 8K timeline. So I have this guitar clip, which is from the Red V Raptor, shot in 8K 30 FPS. And I have a bunch of clips from the Canon R5, shot in 8K 30 FPS. This is an R3D file. This is all Canon RAW. I have put them all on the timeline and even separated the clips. Now, again, for our simple test, we're gonna try and stabilize this red clip. So although it is quite stable, we're gonna go ahead, click stabilize. It's like a one minute 8K file. Pretty quick, in my opinion. One minute 8K file, even if it takes like 10, 20 seconds, that's good performance. We're almost halfway there. Even though the clip is pretty stable, I just wanted to test it out. And we have about 10 seconds remaining. This is actually good performance. We were trying to stabilize a clip in Premiere. It took 42 seconds for a smartphone clip. This is an R3D file. So that's really commendable. Next up, we're gonna try and stabilize this Canon clip as well. This is happening very quick because it's a shorter clip. So that's that. So with the stabilization out of the way, let's see if we can scrub through this footage and play it back at full quality. So scrubbing, there is some drop frames. And when I play this back, it is a little choppy. We're not getting that full 30 FPS, but that can be fixed. We can go into playback, set the you know timeline resolution, playback resolution to a quarter. And now we're getting smooth playback. So we're able to play back 30 FPS, 8K video files that are not transcoded. These are R3Ds and Canon RAW files. This is good performance. The Mac Mini isn't really heating up. It's a little warm to the touch, some hot air coming out the back, but I can barely hear the fan, which is a good thing. Now to make this a little more uh, demanding, let's go into the color tab and try adding in some LUT files. So I'm gonna get the red R3D LUT. Uh, I can just do add to current node. We have done that. We're gonna go into all LUTs, search for a Canon one. I'm just gonna drop random ones right here. So add to current node, add this. 
and I don't really know a lot of results so you guys let me know if I'm making any mistakes I just know a few basic things can we come back into the edit tab now let's see if we can still play this back pretty smooth Talking about render times, the first 4K project that we did in Premiere Pro was rendered at 240 megabytes per second and the final file size was about 18 gigabytes and that took 8 minutes and 40 seconds. The 8K timeline was 1 minute and inside Resolve that took about 5 minutes and 50 seconds. The takeaway here is that 4K editing is totally possible on the M4 Pro Mac Mini. And I'm talking about serious projects with multiple layers, effects, color grading, transitions, motion graphics. If you're doing all of that, the M4 Pro Mac Mini can do it without any issues in Final Cut, in Resolve, or in Premiere if you're using that. But when it comes to 6K and 8K video editing, if you're doing light projects, just a few you know, simple effects and cutting through clips and rendering them out, it's gonna be fine, but if you're gonna be doing multiple 8K layers with color grading, motion graphics, transitions, effects, all of that, then it's gonna bring the Mac Mini M4 Pro to a halt. It's still possible, but if you want a smoother, more you know efficient experience, I would say look forward to the Mac Studio with the M4 chips. Now, while the Mac Mini itself can be had for $600 or $1400 if you go for the M4 Pro version, there are some extra costs that come with it and a lot of people aren't really talking about it. First of all, you are going to need a monitor and a keyboard and a mouse, which is going to cost you extra. And you should get ones that work over Bluetooth because USB-C peripherals are really hard to find and you don't have USB-A ports to plug receivers into. Now, if you get the base model of M4 or M4 Pro, you're only going to have 256 or 512 gigabytes of storage. So you are gonna need extra storage as well. Something like this from SanDisk, which is a terabyte, is gonna cost you anywhere from 100 to $150. So do consider that as well. But these external SSDs are really useful. They can come in handy for content creators as well if you like to edit videos. And you can actually edit videos over these kind of SSDs. Now, if you want to plug, you know, SD cards into your Mac Mini, you're gonna need an SD card reader. And for that, I would recommend you guys get a USB hub of some sort, or even better, a Thunderbolt dock. Something like this comes with external power adapters, so you have a bunch of high-speed ports that all work on full speed. So you have extra USB-A, Ethernet, display port, you have a bunch of USB-C, and towards the front, you have a micro SD card reader as well as a full size SD card reader. And you also get, you know, a bunch of extra USB ports. But something like this is going to cost you anywhere from $200 to $300, depending on which brand you go for. This specific one is from OWC. I'll try to drop a link down below for you guys. But yeah, those are some of the extra costs that you need to keep in mind before you buy the Mac Mini. But the Mac Mini is super versatile when it comes to setting it up. All you need is two cables, so display and power. And if you connect wireless peripherals to it, you're basically ready to go with a really tiny desk and the world's cleanest looking setup. But if you're anything like me, you can go a little extra and build yourself a full-blown workstation just with the Mac Mini. And having ports in the front is super convenient. You can connect storage as well as headphones right here without you know reaching out towards the back and all these peripherals are connected with one thunderbolt cable coming from the dock so we have speakers we have my microphone right here the audio interface external storage and my peripherals are completely wireless now talking about temperatures and fan noise on apple silicon I couldn't find an easy way to monitor temperatures, but it should be somewhere in the ballpark of 90 to 100 when we're rendering you know, 8K videos, I'm not quite sure. But when it comes to fan noise, most of the time it's very quiet, but when you're editing you know, 8K videos or rendering them especially, the Mac Mini gets hot, and there's you know hot air coming out the back, and the fan does spin up. Under max load, the fan spins up like a gaming laptop or a MacBook Pro, that's in max load, slightly louder than that. Now, I found an app that can spin the Mac Mini's fan to its full potential, and here's how that sounds.
Now don't worry, your Mac Mini is not gonna be making that kind of noise on a day-to-day -day basis. But yes, if you do manage to push this machine to its max potential, the fan does spin up and it's audible. 